Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. We're glad to see you. It is November. We've all survived an ice storm. Does everybody have power at this point? <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> is there anybody that's still struggling without that? Because I know we had quite a few that gone 12, 13, 14 days without power, which was not fun. I know. So, and, um, we're glad to see you guys here today. There is a link to the running agenda in the chat. And uh, if you want to just uh, jot in the chat real quick where you're from. So we kind of have an idea of what's going on. Also, we're going to give you a little bit of information, just some things that we need to share with you. But if you have questions uh, that you would like for us to address, this is where you can put that in the chat and um, my colleagues, Brenda and Deb, will be monitoring that chat and making sure that we can get your questions addressed. So uh, I want to introduce myself. My am Melissa Algram. I'm the RSA director. I think most of you know me. I recognize most of the names on here, but you know, we always have uh, the chance of somebody new joining in. Uh, Brenda, would you introduce yourself real quick, please? Hi, I'm Brenda Beamer Chapman, and maybe the person who has emailed some of you asking you to make corrections on your RSC plan. Um, I am the Director for Social Studies and Personal Financial Literacy, and it's been great to talk to some of you on email. Okay, and Deb? I'm Deb Wade. I'm the Director of Elementary ELA, and I have also been helping with some of the plans, so I may have talked to some of you as well, but I'm excited to be here today. All right, thank you both for your help. Okay, so I should be sharing our agenda. Uh, Deb or Brenda, can you confirm for me that that's what you see? Thank you. All right, so you uh, have uh, access to uh, all three of our email addresses on this agenda. This is a running agenda so that we, uh, if you've missed previous meetings, uh, you can uh, kind of see what was discussed. Also, please realize that these meetings are being recorded and the recordings of these meetings live on the RSA coordinator page up at the very top. So it usually takes me a day or two to get that recording processed and put up there with that link. And then we also have the link to this running agenda up there as well, just for your reference. So, cause I know that sometimes some of you are managing teaching or school duties at this time. Um, but many of you are also uh, just in different meetings and pulled in a lot of different directions like we all are these days. So that way you do have that access. So first and foremost, let's talk about reports. So this is RSA reporting season. Um, every fall, it is just um, always a, a delight and so much fun to read all of the different plans and to get through the reports. I know it's something that you absolutely live for every year. So, <laughs> sorry, a little bit of sarcasm in there because I, I do know it gets very tiring hearing from us. Um, there are three different reports for RSA that are all due in the fall. And I know sometimes there's frustration in thinking, well, I just certified a report. What do you mean you want me to do another one? Um, we have talked about if there is any way to consolidate those reports, and there really isn't because they all ask for different things um, in such a way that you really just can't do them all on the same thing. Uh, so I do, uh, I do appreciate many of you have had a lot of patience with us as we're trying to help you with technical issues. Um, but just to kind of give you a quick rundown with the annual district reading plan, that's the big plan that we fill out. Um, it was due August 30th. And we read, and you're looking at the, the team of three right now that has read every single one of those reports. So we have about 935 elementary schools that have to fill out a plan and we read every single one of them. And if we're seeing something that looks like it might eventually get you as a school in trouble with non-compliance, that's when we ask for a correction to be made so that you have record of this is what you're doing for that compliance. Uh, we are down to about 25 sites that we're still working with to get those corrections. We have asked those to be done this week. Uh, so we are very hopeful that we can get that checked off of our list um, because we've, uh, we know that those all have to be done before we can turn that over to state aid. The other part of uh, the reports that really figures into our allocations is the beginning of year report, which was due October 1st. And I am just 
thrilled to be able to say every single site has their report done and certified as of yesterday. So that's um, wonderful. We're very happy about that. Um, we've I've double checked every single one of them to make sure we haven't uh, had any duplications of numbers or we've left something off. So we should be good to go there. So the last report that we still currently have in play is the third grade promotion retention report that's located on the WAVE. As of this morning, we have about 125 sites that need to complete this report. And there's about 75 sites that haven't completed, just need to certify the report. Uh, so you might just double check uh, and make sure, see if there's something that you need to do with that. I do know that um, this report has required a lot of patience um, and uh, sometimes caused a lot of frustration with the technical platform. I do apologize for that. We are trying to work with OMES to see what we can do. I know that there were some uh, updates to the WAVE that added some extra security issues that caused some people to have problems with logging in. Uh, so we are continuing to work on that. We did extend the deadline. This was originally due October 31st. It is now due November 16th. Um, I am monitoring the number of open tickets that OMES has for access to the WAVE, and if we need to extend that deadline again, we will. Um, we, we do need to have this data in order to uh, complete the legislative study that's required to be done by the end of January to present to the governor's office, uh, but uh, we do have some wiggle room to extend that a little further if we need to. Uh, but if you are finding that you have, um, are having difficulty with something, you've submitted an OMES ticket and you're not hearing back, um, please update with that. If you need to send, uh, help, have me help you follow with that, send me just a quick, you know, hey, we, we're not able to get access to it and here's our service ticket number because I can send that on as well and say, I have a principal that can't get their report done because of this. Um, but I do have to have a service ticket number to refer to um, if, I'm, if I'm going to do that on your behalf. So just kind of a side note there. If you have not completed this report yet, there is a video tutorial. It's only about 15 minutes long um, that you can find the link to right here. It is also located at the top of the actual report. Uh, that will help you tremendously because there's not a lot of direction on the headers. It's not just one of those intuitive, you really do need to know what is it you're looking for. One of the biggest issues that we have found of um, schools that have not been able to save as they come back later on and did not realize that for students being promoted, that there had to be two check marks for that student. Um, how, when they were being promoted, whether it was end of year, over the summer, or mid-year, as well as how they were being promoted, whether um, you know, the good cause, uh, student reading proficiency team, or screener. Um, what, what we're found is a lot of times they checked the how they were being promoted, but they forgot in those for that first section of they still had to, to show when. Uh, so if you realize that uh, you don't have two check marks for those kids being promoted, that would cause a problem for you. That's not always the case uh, that we're finding with every problem, but that has been maybe one of the more frequent issues that we've noticed. So if you're running into that, um, hopefully that will help with that. Um, but yeah, if, if, you're, if you've sent that service ticket and you still don't have something, uh, just shoot me an email, let me know, give me that service ticket number so that I can forward that on to OMES um, and, and see what we can do to help you with that. So, okay, so the other question that's come with that is, do we have an allocation for RSA this year? And uh, we are happy to say, yes, we do. There is a line item for RSA uh, in the budget. Uh, so it's, it's not a, it's up in the air. Now, last year, RSA was fully funded for the first time in its history at $12 million. Um, this last year, for, for this fiscal year, um, it's being funded at $11 million. They did, uh, as I think every pot got a little bit taken out of, and RSA did have a, a $1 million uh, taken out to be able to help with other issues related to COVID, obviously. 
Um, but that $11 million is still more than what we are used to getting, which is about a $6.5 million allocation, which is historically what RSA has had. So that is a good thing. Uh, as soon as all of those plans are approved, we will be sending that data to state aid. The state aid will then have to go through their uh, computations to figure out that per pupil allocation. And then uh, we will have to double check to make sure we haven't left anybody out. You know, all those things that we do when we're dealing with money and we wanna make sure that we have it right. Uh, and as soon as we get that out, um, then that allocation will show up on your allocation application in uh, single sign-on. We will also send out a notification in the uh, administrator newsletter as well as the RSA newsletter that the allocations have been sent out. Uh, for those of you that are new to dealing with RSA, that allocation is basically given to your district and then you do not file claims on this. This is not like Title I. It's that money is there uh, that you need to be able to spend it. Uh, there is a funding checklist because how we do track that expenditure is through the OCAS codes or the Oklahoma Cost Accounting System. So this funding checklist lists the different OCAS codes for any allowable expenses under RSA. So when you're thinking about what can you spend that money on, thinking about what will improve kindergarten through third grade reading. So it needs to be limited to those four grade spans and it needs to be dealing with the area of reading. So general information or math textbooks, things like that would not be approved. Um, you know, the, one of those, you'll, you'll get that email saying you need to shift this to a different uh, funding source. Um, things that don't improve reading, uh, such as a reading rug, uh, would not be appropriate expenditure for RSA. But things like books, um, salaries for uh, reading specialists or tutors would be helpful. Uh, professional development is always very helpful, especially, again, focusing on the area of reading. Um, we are still allowing those ex funds to be used for purchase of technology, uh, especially when we're talking about distance learning. So if you are still needing to address iPads, Chromebooks, hotspots, things like that, that would work for this year. Normally, that's not something we allow with these funds. Uh, just because this is a very limited, but this is not a, no, a normal year, which I think we can all attest to. So, um, Deb and Brenda, let me stop there. Do we have any questions about reports or funding and expenditures? Okay, there was one question about what about materials for the reading PD? Would that fall under what you could spend for? Yes, yes. So like if you're doing a reading professional development and you need a, a book for everybody or you need things for them to be able to work with, um, absolutely. Uh, now, going and buying uh, chocolate to put on the tables, that's probably not, that's, that's stretching it. <laughs> so, but materials for the actual learning, absolutely. So, and remember, this is for kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. So, the same grades that RSA deals with K through three. So like if I was able to answer that question. So yep. I felt accomplished. I figured. <laughs> so if you're looking at getting books, um, you know, those grade spans K through three, you can do that with RSA. If you're wanting to expand it to either pre-K, fourth or fifth, uh, that would have to be a different funding source. Okay, Melissa. So follow-up question. So what about post-its and markers and things like that with that? Yeah. Fall? Yeah, Krista, because you, you need to be able to use those things um, to do that. So absolutely, that's, that's those supplies. So that's all the questions except for a collective frustration that you can't get a username and password from the WAVE and she had to go through her principal to fill out the reports because she can't get it. <laughs> and I, I, all I can say is I'm sorry. I wish I had control over that to at least be able to do something about it. At this point, I don't, um, except that I'm happy to make a nuisance of myself on your behalf. Um, so, but uh, we, I, we're very aware there are conversations that are continuing to take place. I know that this is something that is much bigger than RSA as far as dealing with the wave because there's multiple reports housed there. Um, it's just that we happen to have an early in the year report, which uh, seems to catch people for the first time. So hopefully we can uh, smooth this out uh, for 
remaining reports throughout this year and um, we, we keep trying to see how we can make this a little bit better. So anything else on reports or allocation? All right. Oh, here's one more. Supplies for printing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The I mean, cartridges even? Uh, yes. I mean, within reason. I mean, if you're putting ink cartridges in every printer in the building, that's going to show up. I mean, that, that's one of those that um, it's, it's a trust thing of that things, but you have to, it costs money to get materials ready for professional development. I mean, that's, that's a reality. And if you're doing a PD, you need to be able to fully fund that PD uh, through RSA. So yes. Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some resources that have come available in the last month uh, that might be really helpful for you. Uh, one is, uh, has been recently come out with the uh, Institute of Education Sciences, or IES, and they have made a companion document to one of their practice guides. If you are not familiar with IES, IES practice guides, I've linked the original guide here on the agenda. It's the Foundational Skills to Support Reading for Understanding in Kindergarten through Third Grade. These practice guides, which cover a lot of different areas, reading, math, MTSS, uh, management, writing, um, many of these areas, at both elementary and secondary, are based in the research and do a great job of summing up, here is what research says is effective, here is what research says is less effective, um, and giving recommendations for how we can uh, make sure that we're using evidence-aligned practices in our classroom to help increase student achievement. So the practice guide, if you have not read it, is really helpful. But in order to go with that, this companion document is a first grade teacher's guide to supporting family involvement in the foundational reading skills. And so it looks like this. It is lengthy. It is 146 pages. So this is not something that you're going to pick up and read in five minutes. However, um, there is a lot of information in here that can be really helpful. So you'll see that they have different recommendations. One is academic language, and then different activities that can be done to, both in the classroom and with the family to help support academic language growth with first graders. If you teach kindergarten or second or third grade, this could also probably be very helpful for you because you can always make those same shifts because a lot of times our kids just need the same things um, but maybe at a little higher or lower uh, rigor level. Uh, also keeping in mind that with this year, we, I've, I've had many conversations with many of you about how you're seeing that your students are coming in much lower this year. They have missed instruction. Um, and we've, we're even talking about where with our upper grades that test, they maybe didn't miss as much instruction because the time that we were out from spring break to the end of the year was often spent on test prep, testing, things like that. But for K through two, that's not the case. We, in our, in our early childhood, we teach right up until that last day of school. And so our littles really did miss a lot of significant instruction. Other recommendations uh, from IES with this would be things like phonological awareness and letter sound relations. Uh, there is more and more research. If you've ever listened to me ever speak, you know I talk a lot about phonemic awareness and its importance on later reading skills. And um, this is one of those skills that often gets bypassed or overlooked or not gone into as much in depth. And so this is one of those really essential skills that if we want kids to be successful in fourth grade, sixth grade, 12th grade, they have to have this solid foundation in these very beginning skills. And they've given a lot of interesting information here, things like family literacy videos, family activities, teacher scaffolds. So, um, and then another recommendation on decoding uh, and analyzing words, as well as being able to write them and spell them, and then moving into fluency and comprehension. So again, just a really helpful um, uh, guide that's come out that this would be probably one of those things that might be helpful to look at with PLCs to take a section and let's just take a deeper dive into that um, and also thinking about how we can get our families engaged because whether we're uh, in person 100% of the time 
or we are virtual 100% of the time or doing some type of hybrid, we know that our families are going to have to be more involved this year to ensure our student success because that's where we're hearing um, is it's just trying to get them involved and get them going with that. And sometimes it's just making it accessible to our families. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Education has recently come out with uh, what they've called mass literacy. And let me pull this up for you because this is just a really um, nice, clean website for talking about the different components of the core literacy block, as well as our skills for early reading. And it even pulls in MTSS. Uh, just that reminder that uh, the multi-tiered systems of support, which the academic side, we call the response to intervention or RTI, uh, that is the framework that RSA is built on. So if you are using an MTS system or RTI, uh, sometimes we use that um, for a pa one pathway towards special education as a possibility, uh, but it also works for our general education students under RSA and other, other programs. Uh, addressing students experiencing reading difficulties, and then also talking about equity in early literacy, which is, I know, a topic that a lot of us are really focused in on these days. Uh, also, there is a webinar that is coming up next Thursday called Stepping Through Sounds, a look at phonological awareness. Uh, Kendra Shank, who is an Otis coach, for those of you that are familiar with Otis, they're the Oklahoma Tiered Intervention Systems of Support. Um, is a literacy consultant that lives down in Chickasha, and she is going to lead this webinar as we look at uh, phonological skills, uh, starting with a little bit of why we teach them, but spending the bulk of the time of how and giving some practical examples of how this can be used in the classroom. This is a free event. There is a registration. Recording is only available to the members of the Reading League Oklahoma. Um, that's only, it's only a $25 membership, so those of you that are interested in that, that's fine. There's the information that you can look for there, um, but this is certainly a free event on um, that Thursday night at 7 o'clock. There's also another free recorded webinar uh, from the National Reading League. Uh, this was their keynote at their conference they had last week. Dr. Tracy Whedon, who is the president and CEO of Nye House Education in Texas, uh, gave a talk about literacy, the civil right of the 21st century. I've had an opportunity to listen to it already. And if you are dealing with anything, dealing with equity, struggling readers, or anything along those lines, this is worth a listen um, because it, she really hits on a lot of really good, strong points. And then finally, a couple of podcasts because, you know, we all have our podcasts that we li like to listen to. Um, the, the bottom one, the Science of Reading, the podcast has been around for about a year. Uh, it's uh, sponsored by Amplify Education, uh, that they have a lot there. And then the TRL, or the Reading League podcast, uh, just started. I think they have two episodes out already and getting ready to release a couple more. So it's uh, just helpful to know some of those uh, resources that are there as we are um, learning and trying to see how we can continue to better our craft with students, whether we're, again, working with them face-to-face -face or uh, virtually. So, uh, as I say, I, was there any questions that came up, Brenda or Deb, on that? Because okay, we're... so Melissa, there's one that they're really struggling with doing screener assessments with some students that have severe disabilities, and they know it's supposed to be for all students, but it's a continuous struggle. So, any guidance on um, the screeners for their severe disabilities kids. I think the, the biggest thing, because that's one that I have talked to Todd Lofton, our deputy superintendent on special education about, as well as our legal department. And um, I think probably the biggest guidance there is to be very aware of any stop or discontinue rules around your screener. So most of our screeners, if not all, have some type of rule that says, um, you know, like if they don't have an answer within the, you know, or they get the first three wrong, stop. Or if they um, aren't able to answer within five minutes or, or to that point, um, which allows that to stop quickly rather than having to sit there throughout the whole battery. Um, I, that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing is making sure that the teachers that work with those students with severe disabilities, uh, or, or any type of, of issue there are aware of those stop rules so that we can get through those pretty quickly. But they, uh, 
the answer that I have received has been pretty adamant that this is dealing with all students and it gets into that slippery slope of uh, if we uh, don't, if we excuse some, then where, where does it keep on? That line keeps moving. Uh, and, and that's why I've been told, no, uh, we, we do have to address all students there. And you send that stop rule out in print. Um, so Angela, if you will uh, contact with your vendor uh, who's in there and ask them what are the stop or discontinue rules that should be in your technical manual they uh, the different rules uh, the stop rules are different for each of the screeners uh, but they are located in that technical manual but if you can't find it because some of those technical manuals are pretty hefty i would ask your rep please send us because sometimes they'll have it on a one page uh, what is that discontinue rule or that stop rule that we can use uh, when our students are struggling and they, we need to stop the assessment so, and Kristen, as far as about not get, I don't have, um, I am not in the room where it happens when it's talking about the OSTP. So no, I don't have any information um, about that. I, I don't even know if discussions are taking place or not. I, I can make assumptions like everybody else can, but I certainly don't want to make false assumptions on a call like this and let you think that I know something when I really don't. Um, I, I understand your concern and I would say um, continue to make your voice heard and, and I know opinions and concerns and, and thoughts are being heard and listened to. Um, so that's that, yeah, that's, that's a little higher on the food chain than I am. <laughs> so, all right, Deb, I'm actually going to ask you to unmute for a moment and talk about our next agenda item. All righty. Well, um, hopefully some of you or most of you got an email in one way or another or on social media. We have shared out the draft for the uh, ELA standards and we are in the public comment time. It started um, about a week and a half ago and then it's going to run until December 3rd. And um, the email is there that public comment ela at sde.ok.gov that's our official public comment feedback um, tool but what we're hoping for is that um, different plc's different grade level teams um, vertical teams we just what we really really desire is to get as much feedback as possible um, in in every way um, for this particular group, I, I will say um, a little a little plug for my um, my teams that worked so incredibly hard. Um, I've my two teammates who are here today. They've provided uh, the group with just immeasurable insight, and the early childhood team worked so hard to make sure that early literacy was. Um, improved upon and had more clarity there was more of a vertical progression and so um, that that was truly what was driving a lot of their work and so i hope that that's reflected in those standards and that you can see it some of the big changes if you haven't looked at it and i apologize i did not um i i knew we wouldn't have time for the slides that jason stevenson and i have developed but the new standards are by grade level now instead of by grade band and oh thank you how fantastic I say, i'm going to try to get through here without making everybody seasick <laughs> would this be a helpful page right there that, that's wonderful yep that's great so what we've done is um we do have the header at the top so hopefully you can just really quickly and easily find your grade and uh, we have the reading strand on the left hand side and then that strand statement and then we have the writing strand on the right hand side with that strand statement and then all of the objectives are listed below and one of the reasons that we decided to do this side by side is um, we just had a lot of people on this team who really believe in that integration of reading writing skills together and so to be able to see how one parallels another was really exciting for us and so this formatting um, we, we were just super excited about just this one thing alone. 
And um, you're going to see when you go through there that we really tried very hard to, um, like I said, develop those early childhood skills, uh, the early literacy skills. We actually, our team um, came up with a whole new strand of encoding instead of just decoding. So that was exciting. And also, there's more of a progression in language um, as far as what do we hope for our youngest learners to be able to accomplish and how does that progress all the way through. So um, we're, we've already kind of gone through some of the feedback that we've received. Um, we're trying very hard to make sure that things are appropriate to the age of our learners. Um, so I think sometimes when we looked back at it, they were kind of lofty. And then sometimes I don't know that we were giving our, our kids enough credit. And so we really, um, I can't speak enough to the hours and hours that the educators in this state gave to this project. And so I hope you have some time in the next couple of weeks to, to take a look at your grade band or your, um, your grade and just see what you think and give us some feedback because we really do desire to know what, what the educators in our state think of this. Um, I'm, I'm, I like it, but of course I'm probably the wrong person to, to throw my hat in right now. So, um, and you can always email me directly about questions, but the feedback itself um, does need to go to that public comment ELA email address. I apologize if I was making anybody see six scrolling, but I wanted to get down here to like the appendices that have been worked on. You know, so again, in our previous, correct me if I'm wrong, Deb, but I think in our previous version of our standards, we still had the 40, 44 phonemes of English language, which um, again, very helpful for our early literacy friends. Um, but there's some information here about the recursive writing process. Um, more information about genre guidance, which I know has been requested quite a bit about what things we should be looking for. Um, again, information about the text complexity, which we have had in the past. I love this page talking about our different tiers of vocabulary. If you're not familiar with that, um, make sure to look up Isabel Beck, uh, B-E-C-K, because that's where this is coming from. Um, and this is uh, very common. It's unfortunate that she used the word tiers because we have tiers in so many different areas. And I think everything was being developed at about that same time. But um, it does let us know that there's different levels of vocabulary that we do address. Um, but I really appreciated um, the explanation here on the different types of multimodal literacies. Uh, because I know you were saying that a lot of the teachers often deal, uh, look at this as just dealing with digital. Uh, when Correct. it really means so much more. Um, and mm -hmm. this is a great graphic to look at the different types of uh, literacies that might be involved when we're looking at multimodal. So, uh, um, Melissa, will you, will you scroll back up to um, one of the things in Reading Foundations that might have that alphabetized list? That's probably something. Yes, I but I would recommend everyone just kind of look at your screen for a second. Okay. I got to get through 100 pages. <laughs> I should so, have. So, have so, um, there's I'm a sorry. couple of questions in the chat box while Perfect. she's scrolling. Well, um, we got it. Okay, go ahead. Is there a is there a plan to add samples of each standard or would that be left up to the district? Exemplary um, samples? Well, what, uh, the progression of, of work that we have in mind is that once we do have the standards approved and that won't happen until next semester, um, then we go into the work of uh, going to the, putting out some professional development with schools and across the state for you know, here's what they have, here's how to implement them. But really, as, as far as any kind of exemplary things, that's a lot of that supplemental resourcing is gonna be on the curriculum framework. And that can't be updated until the standards are approved. And so it's, it's, a, it's a sequential thing. And as far as when do they start, that's a great question. Um, once we go through our whole process, then we kind of have to go into a holding pattern until assessment has their materials updated so that they're ready to assess those new standards. So we can't put them into play 
until the assessment department is ready for that to happen. And so that, that is why um, you know, it doesn't happen immediately. We don't approve them this spring and they go into effect in August. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that quickly because there's so many different uh, departments who have a hand in it. Um, but as far as sequential, I asked Melissa to go back to this because this is something that we actually talked about in her office today. Um, you're going to notice in the Reading Foundations standard, standard two, it is the only one that has this particular um, method, and so I wanted to be sure and point it out. So you're going to see on this particular example that she pulled up that the skills are listed alphabetically, and that is another um, thing that the early childhood team did very intentionally because they wanted to make sure that we were putting the skills in the order in which students best learn them. So we have an asterisk there that says these are sequential skills and we do realize that we're not saying you have to teach them that way. So let me be very clear on even on the draft, that's not what, what is being said here, but rather the research shows this is how students best learn these skills. So anytime you see that asterisk with the sequential skills, it's because we looked at the research and the research showed that the students are going to learn these best in this order. So I just wanted to point that out. You're gonna see that only in this particular standard. So Deb, if I have a, a purchased curriculum and um, they're doing this, but maybe they flip-flopped two of those. I don't have to throw out that curriculum, correct? This is no. a recommendation that's based, there's a scope correct. and sequence in our curriculum that we correct. can certainly follow. But if our scope and sequence in our curriculum is based on research, it's going to be pretty close to this. I would, I would think yeah. so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so absolutely. And that's kind of, I think just kind of where we're pointing out is, we do know that our early learners do have to have a systematic and sequential uh, curriculum in order to be successful. That's, um, that is uh, critical for our neediest learners and it's helpful for all of our learners. Uh, so that I think is where the team was working on is trying to reflect that research in our standards, not trying to dictate a scope and sequence or a curriculum, but knowing that this is what the research says. And if we have a research-based curriculum, it's going to be really close to that. Um, there sometimes might be um, a little bit of a flip or we might be finishing up with one skill as we work with another skill. And, and that's understandable, it's certainly fine, but it would be very rare in a research-based curriculum that uh, we would be working on vowel digraphs before we addressed consonant blends uh, because that's just not how we function with those words. So that would be the, the rationale there. Okay, were there any other questions that came up with um, our standards? And I did not warn Deb that I was gonna do this to her. So thank you for being so impromptu. <laughs> no, there was just a question about adoption. Um, so I just kind of answered it, sorry. <laughs> no, so whenever good. you have thank whenever you. you have standards that are going through the review process, ELA standards won't be um, put through the legislature till the till the session starts. So we couldn't have the adoption this year because you don't have your standards done yet. So it would be the next year, so right now it's the science adoption because the standards were approved last legislative session. So it kind of works in behind. <laughs> so next year, if I'm understanding correctly, would be the um, adoption, you know, the year to uh, look through, make a decision, pilot, adopt. At the same time in the uh, department, uh, we would be also if, if saying that it's been approved by the legislature, then the assessment office would at the same time also be updating their materials so that hopefully if all things align correctly, when these go into effect, when the, uh, any updates to testing materials go into effect, and we also have our new curriculum to go along with that. So just trying to kind of keep all of our wheels together. The uh, one other question that I've been getting quite a bit lately is actually dealing with the dyslexia screener and the requirement under House Bill 2804 that was passed this last spring um, to screen students for dyslexia if they do not meet grade level targets on our RSA screener. Um, and I know we've had a lot of schools trying to figure out which screener they should adopt. 
um, right away. And so do keep in mind that this does not go into effect for schools until the 22-23 school year. So for this school year, um, our office, along with the special education office, are working cooperatively to uh, review dyslexia screening assessments and uh, we will be pre uh, presenting to the state board uh, by June of 2021 at the latest, and that's, that's required under law, um, a list of screening assessments that could be approved for that use, as well as any guidance documents that districts would need. That would allow the following school year, the 21-22 school year, for districts to, again, review those screening, or yeah, those, that dyslexia screening um, options to see what might work best for them, as well as offer any training to their staff, uh, get their procedures in place, uh, so that when this does go into effect for the 22-23 school year, everyone's not in a scramble and trying to build this as we go. So, uh, so if you're, you're, you're in that panic or you've got a superintendent that's saying, hey, we need to get this going, we've got time, it's okay, take a breath, <laughs> and let's just deal, uh, we'll deal with that in a little while, but we, we are working on uh, developing that information for you, um, but it will probably be the end of this school year before anything is released and has to be approved by the board. So, okay, are there any other questions with anything we've discussed or just anything else in general regarding RSA? Will there be any additional funding to meet this dyslexia screening need? At this point, it would be under RSA. Uh, I am not aware of any, uh, but that doesn't mean a yes or no. Again, that there's some other components involved there. Um, but as of right now, unless the legislature decides to uh, apportion more funds to education. So uh, at this point, we have what we have. So uh, I will tell you that one of the things, and Sherry, that's a good question, will any of the existing screeners be able to use for the dyslexia? That is a possibility, and we are just starting looking at those. Um, I do know some have expanded that. Uh, most of those companies are very aware that this is something that's happening nationwide and are, uh, have been developing the screening assessments and have been doing the reliability and validity studies because those do take time. Uh, to do that. One of the things that pieces of information that we are asking for is cost, obviously, uh, to, so that we can have that to be aware. But we are um, wanting this to be a more comprehensive uh, assessment, so it's not piecemealed together, but something that can work together and it makes it easier for teachers to understand the data. Um, and again, we are keeping that in mind. I mean, we, we wouldn't approve because um, we're not going to get just one, so it won't be one cost, but keeping that in mind so that districts have that information and makes it a little more competitive for them. So, all right, anything else? Well, we might give you 15 minutes back to your day, and we hope if that's the case, we will be... Um, and so, Gail, yes, it would be next year before we review these screeners, because we're in that process of of making sure that what is approved and, and optional would be uh, would be the requirements because there's some pretty specific requirements in that legislation that have to be done. Um, any news on auto promote for virtual screening? I am still <laughs> here's I I know that I sound like a broken record sometimes of waiting for legal to give me that decision on. In for those of you unaware of the conversation, we have had some concerns for students that were screened virtually that have suddenly made an incredibly high score that does not meet uh, what their past history has been of being at risk and at risk and all of a sudden they're advanced on this one assessment. Um, and we want to ensure that we are meeting the requirements of the law, but at the same time, um, uh, making sure that when we apply that uh, promotion through the screening that it is accurate. Uh, so I think that this is one of those things that with everything going on with COVID and all the legal issues coming up, this is one of those that's been on the back burner a little bit because this is something that we would not need to make promotion decisions on until the spring. Um, I know it's something that we all want an answer to right away, but if I'm thinking about all of the other things going on, that's probably why we have this delay. 
uh, which is understandable. Uh, but uh, again, I, I just send my weekly email and say here, we would like an answer for this. And uh, what I would recommend right now is that we hold off on notifications to parents, um, especially in cases where we have some suspicious scores uh, so that we can get that answer and move on from there. So Beth, I'm I, sorry, uh, but I'm still gonna have to say, I'm still waiting on that answer, so. All right, anything else? All right, well, all of you stay safe over the Thanksgiving holidays. I am so thankful to have all of you working for our kids across the state. Um, we will meet again on December 8th, uh, and we will have a recording of this meeting. Uh, it will be posted on the RSA coordinator page, as well as our other meetings and this running agenda, because we try to put a lot of links in there. So if there is anything that you need in the meantime, um, I am happy to say my emails are slowing down a little bit, so it's actually getting to be a manageable amount each day. So I will be happy to uh, address any needs that you might have as quickly as I can. So if you haven't finished your third grade promotion retention report, please feel free to do that as quickly as you can. If you are still having problems with getting response from OMES, let me know. Give me that service ticket number. I will be happy to um, let our liaison with OMES uh, know that we've got some urgent situations here with a couple of these that we really need to move those to the top of the list. So, and, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone when we emailed you for getting back to us and, and correct, making your corrections. Um, we truly were just trying to help you out and we appreciate all of you doing that um, and being grace, uh, giving us some grace too to get it all finished. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. This we were saying this is probably the fastest that we've the smallest team that we've ever had to be able to look at these plans, but yet the fastest we've been able to get it done. Um, and I think that uh, says a lot to the responsiveness that we've received from districts, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, that's made our jobs a lot easier, and it will make it a lot easier for you to get your funding uh, sooner rather than later. So. Um, all, it's kind of one of those teamwork things and we appreciate everybody's help. So, all right, well, we'll stick around for a little bit if somebody had a question that they just didn't want to ask to the group. Um, but otherwise, have a wonderful fall day. Enjoy the nice weather. All right.